Dean Baker is my guest today. He is the co-founder of the Center of Economic and Policy Research and is one of the few economists who correctly predicted the collapse of the housing bubble. We talked about what that experience was like and a lot more, like what he sees as the potential risks for another recession, the connection between the stock market and inequality, how the Federal Reserve keeps people out of work, the true cost of patent protection, and climate change. Here's our conversation. All right, I am here with Dean Baker. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me in. Um, I got introduced to your work because of the 2008 financial crisis, and you were one of the few economists who correctly predicted that there was a housing bubble. Um, before we talk about the present day, could you tell us a little bit about why you saw that there was a bubble and maybe a more interesting question, why so few economists, including up to the chairman of the Federal Reserve, did not see the bubble? Yeah, well, I, I started to be concerned about the bubble. I wasn't, I don't generally look for bubbles, but I, I had noticed the stock bubble in the 1990s and that caused me great concern while it was expanding. And, of course, it burst in 2000, gave us a recession in 2001, which actually was pretty severe if you look at the labor market. If you look at GDP, it doesn't look like a big deal. It's just a couple quarters relatively minor. But if you look at the labor market, we continued to lose jobs. The recession ended in December 2001 officially. But we continued to lose jobs all through 2002 and most of the way through 2003. We didn't get back the jobs we lost until December until January of 2005. At the time, that was the longest period without positive job growth since the Great Depression. Um, we, we passed that, of course, with the Great Recession in 2008-2009. But in any case, um, I thought bubbles could be a big deal. And I noticed the, the rise in house prices in 2001-2002, and I became concerned that this could be another bubble. And essentially what convinced me of that was Greenspan gave testimony before Congress where I forget whether it was in response to a question or his own initiative, but he gave four reasons to justify the rise in house prices, and none of them made any sense. And that's what led me to believe there was a serious issue there. And just to take the main points here, um, house prices were going up in an in unusual historic pattern. If you go back at that time, I had data from the early 50s. Uh, Robert Schiller subsequently constructed a data set going back to the 1890s. Nationwide house prices had just kept pace with the overall rate of inflation. Um, in the period beginning in the late 90s, again, I first heard about it in 2002, but this continued to 06, um, house prices hugely outpaced the rate of inflation. And, you know, then the natural response is, well, maybe that's the fundamentals of the housing market. You know, people just, uh, you know, were overcrowded, whatever you want to say. So the obvious thing to look to was rents. And there was nothing going on with rents. Rents were pretty much following their normal pattern, more or less moving with the overall rate of inflation. Um, other factors, I was looking at vacancy rates. The Commerce Department puts out data on vacancy rates every quarter. Uh, vacancy rates, if there were a tight housing market, you'd expect to be very low. In fact, they were at record highs and rising through this whole period. So none of this made any sense from the standpoint of the fundamentals. So I became very concerned about that. And it also, the bubble was driving the economy. This, again, was easy to see in the data. So construction rose eventually hit a record level of GDP in 2005. It was about 6.8%. The normal uh, share of GDP is about 4%. This is residential construction, to be clear. And it was also driving consu consumption. Um, the savings rate hit record lows. Um, people were spending based on the wealth effect. So to my view, it was very easy to see there was a bubble there, and it was also very easy to see it was going to be really bad news when it when it crashed. And, you know, in terms of the rest of the profession, um, you know, naturally I raised this with a lot of people. Uh, first off, people were dismissive of the idea that there could be a nationwide fall in house prices. I remember once I was at on a panel and uh, one of the people there was a housing economist. I think it was from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And it, just dismissive, he just said, we've never seen this sort of nationwide fall in house prices. And I was saying that's true, but we've also never seen this sort of nationwide run up in house prices. And he's just completely dismissive. So the idea that you could have a sharp fall in house prices simply wasn't anyone's agenda. And then the other part of the story, and this I, you know, to my view is the more incredible part, the idea that it would be difficult to, to replace 
the demand generated by the bubble, that was just alien to people, to, to economist people, that, you know, here we're going to lose, you know, and I was saying, look, if housing falls back to it, construction falls back to its normal share of GDP, we're talking about 2.5, 2.7 percentage points, it's likely to go beyond that because we had enormous overbuilding, and it actually fell to less than 2 percent GDP, so we had a huge amount to replace, about 4.5 percentage points, and then the loss of consumption, that would be another 2 or 3 percentage points of GDP. We can't easily replace that. But mm-hmm. among economists, the idea that you couldn't replace demand was just, Again, they looked at me like I was speaking nonsense. Well, the Fed will just lower rates. You know, that will do it. And I was just looking at them like, what is that responsive to interest rates? There's nothing. There's nothing that responsive to interest rates. You know, housing <laughs> housing is usually what we think of, but the problem is we have too much housing already. So it was just it was just like a religion that, oh, we can't have a problem of a shortfall demand. The Fed just lowers interest rates. That's what happens. So it really was a very, very strange debate from my vantage point that on the one hand, the fact that we had a bubble seemed pretty hard to deny, and the other hand, the fact that when it burst, it was going to have very serious impacts on the economy, um, I, I couldn't understand the, other, the argument on the other side. It was just this blind faith in the power of the Fed. Interesting. So it was almost like this bubble that was driving the economy had gotten so big and so powerful that if it... Uh, you know, people didn't really necessarily see an alternative to replace it to drive the economy or thought that they could just tinker around the edges with interest rates to fix the problem. Yeah, it was it was definitely the latter. They just thought interest rates, you know, and again, I, I raised this. I remember once I was at a session at the American Economic Association convention in January of '04, and Bernanke was on the panel. At that time, he was a Fed governor. He wasn't the uh, the, the head of the Federal Reserve Board. And I raised this, and he just said, yeah, we looked at that. You know, we don't think there's a bubble there. And, you know, if there is, we could, you know, respond to it, just raise rates. Uh, I mean, lower rates, I'm sorry. It, it was just, he was just dismissive that there there was any issue. Um, and that, that was, you know, I mentioned him, obviously, because he's a very prominent and good economist. Um, but that was that was typical. It was just the idea that, that this could be a problem was just literally not on their radar screens. Interesting. But you didn't take out any credit default swaps, try to play the big short on these guys? I sold my condo. <laughs> my wife and I had bought a condo in D.C., and, uh, you know, we saw the price go through the roof, and we were, you know, con- con- concerned that it would plunge. So we, we sold it in uh, 2000, in the spring of 2004. Wow. Um, going off that point and getting to the present day, do you see any uh, comparable bubbles on the horizon, or are there any serious recession risks that you see right now? I don't see any bubbles. A lot of people have been jumping up and down. You know, I get a lot of emails, you could imagine, from what about this, what about that. Now, there are bubbles. I should be clear. You know, Bitcoin clearly was a bubble. It's still a bubble. I mean, I know it's lost two-thirds, three-quarters of its value from its peak, and, you know, as long as it's above zero, I would say it's a bubble. But that's not going to move the economy. Um, a lot of stocks are high priced. I don't mean the market as a whole. The market's high, but not obviously in a bubble. But a lot of stocks arguably are in a bubble. I mean, frankly, I don't understand how Amazon could be worth over a trillion dollars when its profits out of the latest numbers, but they're somewhere around, you know, ten, fifteen billion. You're talking about price to earnings ratio for a mature company of fifty, sixty, maybe even a hundred to one. Um, so that doesn't make sense to me. But if Amazon's price falls by, you know, two thirds, three quarters. Um, you know, bad news for Jeff Bezos and, you know, people own a lot of Amazon stock, but that's not going to sink the economy. Um, house prices are high. Um, I am a little concerned about that. Again, they're not driving the economy. So if you look at residential construction, it's probably still somewhat below the long-term average, uh, which uh, does, uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but um, it, it's not driving the economy through construction. As far as consumption, you know, our savings rates more or less in line with long-term averages. I'm sure some people are spending based on the equity in their home, but again, if house prices were to fall 10, 20 percent, not a prediction, but just saying if that were to happen, um, I don't think it'd have a huge hit to consumption. So I don't see bubbles driving the economy. Um, in terms of the, the housing, the point I was going to make on housing, I think it, the run-up in house prices is largely a fundamental story this time. It is going along with a run-up in rents, so rents are far and away the leading component in inflation. Most of most the, the other components in the consumer price index are, are near zero or 1%. Um, rents have been rising over 3%, 3.5%. 
So it does generally, the run-up in house prices does look like it's largely fundamentals. And the qualification I'll make is that I think we are seeing some areas where particularly the bottom end of the market, bottom third of the market, does seem to be rising more rapidly. And I worry about that, not because it's going to have a major economic impact, but just I'd hate to see a lot of moderate-income homeowners again in the situation where they pay too much for a house and suddenly see the price fall by 15%, 20%, and wipe out their equity, wipe out their life savings. So that's a concern, but it's not its not a macroeconomic concern. That would just be you know, very bad news for a lot of people who really you don't want to see hit again. Uh, in many cases, I'm sure the same people were hit in the, the last bubble. Um, in terms of the, you know, the prospects of are we due for a recession, I have naturally been giving this thought, as you know, most economists or some many economists have, and I, I don't think it's going to be a bubble-driven recession. So basically the way I keep scoring this is that if we look back to the recession since World War II, probably earlier too, but I won't claim familiarity with pre, uh, pre-World War II recessions, but every one of them, with the exception of the 2001 recession and the Great Recession, were caused by the Fed raising interest rates to combat inflation. So if I had to take a bet, what's going to be the cause of the next recession? Well, we'll see some uptick inflation, and the Fed will go too far. And can that happen uh, in the near future? Probably not 219, 220 isn't implausible. Um, I do follow the, the wage data, the price data very, very closely. There's very little story on accelerating inflation. I shouldn't say very little, basically zero story on accelerating inflation at this point. But wage growth has picked up, and it's one of the things that um, I'm surprised hasn't actually gotten more attention. So the rate, you know, if we look at the, the average hourly earnings series, which is the one that we most commonly look at, um, that's ticked up to 3.2% year over year. And if you go back to 2017, it was at 2.5%. That's not a huge increase, but it's some increase. And my guess is it will continue to increase if the unemployment rate stays more or less where it is or creeps lower, which is my best guess. I mean, we probably will see drops in the unemployment rate through 2019. So we probably will see somewhat more rapid wage growth. Thus far, that hasn't been showing up in price growth. Presumably, it means that companies are absorbing that in lower profit margins, which is fine because they had a big increase in their profit margins in the Great Recession. But at some point, I have to imagine that they will start to get passed on in more rapid price inflation. And when that happens, presumably the Fed will start to raise rates more aggressively, and that's the context in which you get a recession. So that's probably not a 219 story. It could very well be a 220 story. Interesting. So you're saying that uh, because there's wage growth right now and prices have not yet reflected that, you're saying that when prices do reflect the wage growth and they start rising, then the Federal Reserve will be afraid of inflation, will raise rates, trying to tamp down the inflation, and the consequence of that could be a recession. Yeah, and that's, you know, as I say, that has been the past pattern. So if you look to the 1990 recession, uh, quite openly, the 81-82 recession, I mean, uh, uh, Folker didn't make too many bones about that. He wanted to stop inflation and he was going to raise interest rates as high as he had to, to do that. Um, 74, 75, you know, 70, I mean, you go down the list, that's pretty much the story of all the post-war recessions, with the exception of the last two, which were driven by collapsing bubbles. Um, okay, so you don't necessarily see a recession as being imminent then. Right. I'd be very surprised if we see one in 2019. I mean, you know, basically I'd say if we get one in 2019, it'd be due to some, you know, endogenous, exogenous factor that, you know, no one's looking at, you know, something like a a collapse of the Saudi government so that, you know, oil shoots to 200 a a barrel or three, you know, whatever would go to depending how much oil gets taken off world markets, that sort of thing. That could, of course, cause a recession any time. But I don't see anything in in the dynamics of the economy itself that's likely to lead to a recession in 2019. Um, There has been a little skittishness on the stock market recently, but one of the interesting things that I heard you say about um, regarding the ups and downs of the stock market is that actually when the stock market drops, one of the effects of that drop is to reduce inequality. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, What did you mean? Yeah, well... It reduces wealth inequality. I've never been a big fan of wealth as a measure. I can go into that at longer length, but I just don't think it really tells us that much. Part of it is that wealth changes hugely depending on what the stock market does. So, 
Um, basically, most of the stock market is held by the wealthy, somewhere around uh, the, the top 1% holds somewhere around 40%. I don't have the exact figure on my fingertips. And if you take the top 10%, you're looking at around 90%. This is of individually held stock. Obviously, you have pension funds, endowments, you know, institutionals holding stock. But as far as individual, you know, individuals holding stock, it's overwhelmingly the wealthy. And what that means is when the stock market goes up, wealth inequality increases. And there were a lot of people who were making big points, some of them my friends, out of, oh, my God, look how bad wealth inequality has gotten over the last, you know, since the, the, the period since the, the crash, you know, because, of course, the stock market's been on this upward tear. And I go, that is the stock market. So you can't you can't both be upset about the rise in wealth inequality and upset at the fall in the stock market. Um Reducing stock prices reduces wealth inequality. There's no two ways about it because that's that's where the money is. So, as I say, I focus much more on income. I think that's the more important, more relevant measure. But if you want to look at wealth inequality, well, the lower stock market means that we'll have less inequality of wealth. Okay, so I see what you're saying. Not necessarily that it's a good thing when the stock market drops, but that if you were to take wealth inequality as your ideal measure, then – the stock market dropping would reduce the wealth inequality. Well, why do you think that that's? Because I've heard you know statistics like, uh, oh, the top uh, you know something like the top twelve uh, wealthiest people in the world have as much uh, wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. But some people say that that's not um, like what you're saying that wealth isn't necessarily a good measure. Um, it, why do you think wealth versus income? Um, well, as I say, wealth is very erratic because of, you know, A, the stock market, B, some of the other aspects of it are just definitional. So say the value of a government bond, that's inversely proportional to interest rates. So if people bought bonds, you know, a long-term bond, a 30-year bond when the interest rate was 6%, you know, if you go back a few years, it, it was that high on, uh, on long-term bonds. And then it falls to 3%, well, or 2%, you know, it's been around there, it's been that low, then the value of that bond will roughly double. So do we think we have a problem with wealth inequality because interest rates are low? I mean, that just strikes me as very strange. Now, when you take the bottom end, you know, the people who do those calculations about, you know, what what uh, percent of the world's population has the same wealth as the uh, top 10 or 100 or 1,000, whatever you want to say, the wealthiest people in the world, well, the people at the bottom are people who have large debts, um, a lot of those people are going to be graduates of Harvard Business School. Um, I'm not concerned that a recent Harvard MBA is 250000 in debt. Right. They could make that up in six months, you know, with what the pay they'll get. So it's just that it's, it's not, to my mind, necessarily a very useful measure. Um, what I think is the more interesting measure, more important measure, is, you know, what's people's income? What are uh, the pie that we have this year? What percent is going to the people at you know the bottom ten percent? What percent is going to the top one percent or one tenth of one percent? I think those are, are much more relevant measures, and I should also point out they're much more they're much more consistent in the sense that those don't change that much through time. When you have a, a measure that's bouncing all over the place, you sort of or at least I'm sort of inclined to say, well, it really doesn't tell us that much. Um, I don't think I don't think anyone could. Have, seriously said with a straight face, we should feel much better about inequality in 2009 because the stock market plunge had meant that you know the top 1% had half the wealth they did the year before, two years before. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay. That, um, yeah, no, that I, I agree. But um, we, when you talk about uh, interest rates, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your opinion on monetary policy. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned that the, the Fed uh, raising interest rates has led to recessions in the past. Um, you said the goal of the federal, the policy of the Federal Reserve should be to maximize employment, to maximize the number of people who have jobs. Could you explain to us uh, why you think that that should be the goal of the Federal Reserve and what is their goal right now? Well, the it's important for people to understand. That I say this to people and they sometimes think I'm a conspiracy theorist. The Fed is basically deciding how many people could have jobs. So when they raise rates, I mean, they can't always, uh, people often make the analogy, they can't always get the economy to grow as much as they want. So coming out of the Great Recession, I don't think there's any doubt, Bernanke would have liked to have seen 
the economy grow more quickly, more jobs created. They can't always do that. It's sort of it's like pushing on a string. You can't really do that. On the other hand, you can pull on the string and slow the economy. So the Fed does that when it raises rates. It's preventing the economy from growing more rapidly, limiting the number of people that have jobs. Now, the rationale for doing it is that they're concerned that we're going to have a problem of inflation, which, you know, is real. I mean, you can have problems of inflation. Everyone points to the 70s. That's four decades ago now. But, yeah, inflation was certainly higher than, you know, was desirable. It was definitely a problem. So, you know, their their argument is, well, we have to raise rates to make sure we don't have inflation. But the problem is none of us knows exactly the point at which we're likely to see inflation. So we have this idea, and, you know, it's supported by evidence that low unemployment rates, you are going to have higher rates of inflation. It's kind of almost definitional. You know, how can you be an economist not think that, you know, increased demand leads to higher prices, in this case higher wages, which get passed on in higher prices. So at some point, clearly, we get a low enough unemployment rate, wages start rising rapidly enough that there's a problem with inflation. But we don't know what that point is. So my argument is, we have to try to push as far as we can until we clearly see evidence of inflation. If not, we're needlessly keeping people out of work. And what do you say to someone who's got family to support, and here we are raising rates because we think there could be inflation? Um, that just seems to me a really bad argument. It has real-life, real-world consequences. It's not that this person's lazy or they're stupid or they don't have the skills. We're keeping them from having employment because we have this idea in our head that we're about to see inflation. So my argument is, no, let's wait till we actually see inflation. And, you know, the risk, and, I, you know, again, I've had this argument with many economists. They always say, oh, well, we could be too late and inflation will get out of hand. We don't have models that show inflation just soaring. So, you know, inflation today is about 2%. We could argue whether that's the right number or not, but that's what the Fed targets. So we could say, okay, let's say you're going to target 2%, which means, you know, again, their, their own target, that's an average. So sometimes we should be above it, sometimes we should be below it. That's an average. Um, the inflation rate is not going to just jump to 5%. It's a gradual process. So in the event that we did start to see inflation accelerate, then sure, then the Fed would be right to raise rates. And if it starts to accelerate, you know, enough to get them sufficiently worried, then, you know, you raise rates more rapidly. Um, you know, it, it may get a little higher than we want, but the idea that somehow it would be a horrible thing if the inflation rate hit 3% or even 3.5%, I, I, there's just no evidence to support that. I mean, the economy's functioned very well, you know, the U.S. and other economies, with inflation rates that were considerably higher than that. So to my view, we're, we're basically making a choice where there's totally asymmetric risk in the sense that if we raise rates and keep people from getting jobs today, we know we are we are subjecting a lot of people to real hardship. On the other hand, if we make the if we err in the other direction, and inflation gets somewhat higher than we would have liked, I just don't. There's very little evidence of much downside to that. We could operate the economy right. could operate very well with three three and a half percent inflation, and that would be a you know bad outcome from that vantage point. I see. So basically, the the cost to our society is greater if we're leaving people without jobs as opposed to potential inflation in the future. Um, shifting gears here, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about patents, because I know you've talked a little bit about intellectual property rights, uh, particularly with regard to the development of drugs. Um, as I understand it, the typical argument in favor of patent protection is that unless you give drug companies the ability to hold exclusive patents on their products, then they won't ever make enough profits to justify researching and developing new drugs. Um, you disagree with that argument. Could you tell us why? Uh, are there other approaches we could take to developing uh, drugs? Well, just to be clear, I don't disagree with that argument. I'm saying it's not the best way. So, in other words, I, I don't disagree that Pfizer would not be spending you know, they do spend a lot of money. They they're, they aren't entirely honest. They exaggerate the amount they spend, but they definitely do spend money on research. So I, I don't think for a minute that they would be spending billions on research if they didn't expect to, to be able to sell a drug in a protect, patent-protected market. It just wouldn't make sense if, you know, when they developed a new drug, it sold as a generic and any, anyone could produce that. So I don't think that part's wrong. What I think is wrong is the presumption that this is the best way to support the research. So what I've been arguing is we'd be much better off having the government directly fund the research. And just to be clear, 
because I realize a lot of people are looking at me like, what do you mean fund the research? I mean, pay for the development of the drug and pay for the, the bringing it through the Federal Food and Drug Administration's approval process. So the FDA would pay for all that, and then the drug would be in the public domain so it could be sold as a generic from day one. And to my view, the arithmetic on this is just incredibly compelling. Rough estimate of the difference between the patent-protected price of drugs, you know, what we're paying today and what we would pay if everything was sold in a free market with no protections, somewhere close to $400 billion a year. It's probably about 360 to $380 billion a year. It's a bit less than 2% of GDP. The industry claims that they do $70 billion a year in research. So that gives you a lot of room that if the government could, say, spend $100 billion a year, they'd be able to get away with less, but let's, let's hypothesize that they increase their spending. They already spend about $40 billion through National Institutes of Health and other agencies, but let's say we increase that by $100 billion. Well, we would still come out ahead somewhere in the order of $300 billion a year in terms of lower drug prices. So mm-hmm. that arithmetic I find very compelling, but the other parts are perhaps even more important. We create all sorts of bad incentives with patent monopolies. And again, this is just kind of definitional. You know, if you ask an economist, what do you think of having a 20 per 25 percent tariff like Trump's imposing? And go, oh, that's a really stupid idea. And one of the reasons is that encourages all sorts of corruption. Well, that's true with patents as well, except we aren't talking about 25 percent tariffs. In some cases, we're raising the price a hundredfold. That's a hundred thousand or ten thousand percent tariffs. It's the same thing, same same story in terms of the market incentives. So what that means is it gives drug companies incentives to 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 be less than honest. I'll be polite here about the safety and effectiveness of their drugs, and it happens all the time that they they have evidence that their drug may not be as effective as they're claiming, but they don't share it with the public. In some cases, probably the most famous one was with Vioxx, the arthritis drug. They had evidence that their drug was harmful to people who had heart conditions, and needless to say, there's a lot of overlap between people who have heart conditions and people who suffer from arthritis. But they, they concealed that because it was a very successful arthritis drug, and they didn't want to lose that market. So that's you know that's the sort of thing you expect to see with the incentives created from patents. The other part of the story, of course, is you, you create this, to my view, utterly absurd situation where we've already paid for the research at the point the drugs are being sold. So the market, the the, the marginal cost of producing, you know, the the next prescription of drugs is almost invariably cheap: ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars. It'd be trivial for you know I understand for a poor person's everything expensive, but for for most people, middle class people, this is not a big deal. But instead, we're charging thousands of dollars to recover research costs that have already been paid. And pretty much by definition, the people who need these drugs are people who are in bad health, people who are suffering from various diseases, life-threatening illnesses. So we're saying, okay, we're going to recover the research cost at that time. And the analogy I often make is, is it's like when you have uh, firefighters coming to your home with your family inside, your burning home with your family inside, and they start to say, hey, we want we want a million dollars. Isn't it worth it to you to, to save your family? And, of course, if you had it, you would, but, you know, no one thinks that's a sensible way to pay firefighters, and I'd say it's the same story with with paying for prescription drug research. Yeah, I I heard you develop that argument uh, a bit more in your book, Rigged, which is free, and you can find it online. Anyone who's listening, check it out. Um, But I wanted to ask you before you go, um, probably long-term, like the biggest issue at least that I see that we're facing as a society is going to be climate change. And um, there are definitely some people out there who say that uh, capitalism itself is the problem. Uh, others who say that an economy geared mainly towards growth is the problem. Um, others who say that ultimately it'll be the market uh, markets themselves that will solve this issue. Uh, do you buy any of those arguments? And just speaking as an economist, what changes, if any, to the fundamental structure of our economy do you believe will be necessary to prevent the worst of a climate catastrophe? Well, you know, I don't, I, I have to say, I don't find the attacks on capitalism or, for that matter, growth terribly productive. It's not as though we have a spare system in our trunk. So people who make the, the, that argument, okay, I could say all sorts of bad things about capitalism, I do all the time. But we don't have another system. We just, you know, we're going to pull it out and put it in place. Uh, you know, so it's fine. You know, there's lots of things I don't like about the world, but the world is the world. 
So we don't really have an alternative. And I just had a debate with someone on growth, and I respect them. And you know, it's, it's I understand people making that argument, but I don't. I don't think anyone actually, they might just say, oh, you know, we should do X, Y, and Z because of growth, but that's just a euphemism. No one, uh, no one knows. If you, if you grab people on the street and go, what, what's the rate of economic growth? I doubt one in ten could give you within a percentage point. You know, I'm an economist, so I know that. That's my job. But growth is an abstraction. For people, it means jobs. It means that they, they're secure in their housing and their health care. So attacking growth, to my view, is just kind of, it's a sidebar, it's a distraction. What we have to do to tackle global warming is radically reduce our consumption of fossil fuels in a relatively short period of time. Also, I've done at least some cursory research because I know people have made a big point of, uh, of highlighting the problems of beef, of meat eating, particularly beef, and that also we should be looking clearly to curb beef consumption. But I think this is best done through through market mechanisms, putting up taxes on fossil fuels. Um, I don't know if a tax on beef is the right way to go, but measures that will certainly reduce beef consumption, maybe a tax on beef. I'm not ruling that out. I'm just saying you have to think it through more carefully than I've done. Um, but I think that is doable, but we have to take steps to both make consumption of the bad things more expensive and really push on, on you know, kind of obvious alternatives. So, you know, free uh, public transportation. I, I, I'm a big bus fan. I, I, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I rode my bike frequently, but when I didn't ride my bike to work, I took the bus. But for some reason, I mean, everyone's talking about uh, light rail and uh, subways and everything. I mean, those are fine, except those take a really long time to build. And buses we have, so I, I, I don't quite understand why this isn't on everyone's agenda that we're just going to have free buses and you know, again, I kind of like, you know, you have conservatives who talk about people abusing it. Go, what would that mean? You know, we're going to have people riding the bus all day? I mean, maybe some homeless people would do that. And, you know, the worst things could happen. So, so you know, so we have to take measures to, um, you know, make it more expensive to emit greenhouse gases and also to, you know, have, you know, low-cost alternatives available. And I, I, I know it's a Herculean task. I think it's doable if we had national commitment to it. I mean, obviously it's a problem when you have some of the White House is insisting that it doesn't have, doesn't exist. Global warming doesn't exist. But you know, we've had enormous improvements in the technology, so we can talk about uh, switching to solar and wind energy in a fairly short time horizon. Obviously not overnight, but we, you know, with subsidies, we have and we can make much further headway there. Um, electric cars, uh, China's way ahead of us here. Why not borrow their technology? Everyone's concerned about China stealing our technology. I'd like to steal theirs. I'm being facetious in saying stealing. We want the knowledge, you know, figure out how to get it. Um, so they're way ahead of us in, in, in electric car production. Um, you know, but, but, I, but clearly we have to go in that direction. And again, I just don't see an alternative to a market economy. You know, someone wants to tell me, you know, here are the steps, A, B, C, D. I'll look at it. But just saying, I don't like capitalism, we should do, you know, some other system, uh, I, I don't think that's very helpful. Dean Baker, thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot for having me on. All right, folks, thank you for listening to Dunk Tank, and thank you to Dean Baker. See you next time.